Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And by morning, I mean it is still just morning. It is approximately 10 o'clock in the morning. Tuesday in the a.m. And since I've had so many loyal viewers complain that all my videos are from my vehicle, I thought we'd come to an undisclosed location. Very pleasant location. Granted, I'm not far from my vehicle, it's just over there. Remember, I'm still walking on a gimp leg, doing the best I can do. Some people are... If you'll excuse me a moment, I forgot to grab my reading glasses. My armor's not that long anymore. Especially at my age. <sighs> and for those of you who know about this, I don't have to do a whole lot of explaining, but for those of you who do not yet know, in June I sustained a mechanical injury just trying to get in and out of my school bus because of the extremely wet rainy conditions we'd had early on in June. And because I'm old and diabetic, things heal slowly. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have that intrepid little notebook. It is, once again, time for Alone, the review. And this will be episode 10. They start the episode off with another quote from a famous person, though I'm not one to uh, be able to tell you much about the famous personage, someone named Mary Sarton. Never heard of Mary before that episode. And the quote was, does anything despair except man? Sorry, can't answer that, don't know. Now, they start off showing last week's uh, ending episode. Uh, and Lucas seemed to be taking things in stride. And the others not so much. That's how they ended episode 9. <coughs> and then they go right into day 37. Now remember, ladies and gentlemen, my opinions <coughs> and my observations are based on having spent 10 weeks myself on Vancouver Island back in the early 80s. So this is not just an armchair quarterback, quarterback deal for me. It's a case of actually been there, done that, burned the t-shirt at least two decades ago. Now, first thing they start off day 37 with is Alan. And he looks extremely gaunt. He has not had anywhere near enough nutrition and his body is cannibalizing itself for the nutrients it needs to stay alive. And he starts out talking about tapping out. Trouble is, why use two words when 150 will do? Right, Alan? For those of you from Rio Linda, that means he, he was having a bad case of verbal diarrhea. Okay, then they move over to Luke, and he's questioning, does he have the strength to continue? He also was looking at Scotch Gaunt as well. They move over to Sam next, and he decides to go bow hunting, and misses. 
Now my eye wasn't exactly quick enough to catch what it was he was shooting at, and I don't think the camera was either. So I don't know if he was actually seeing a critter to shoot at, or if he's uh, so far un malnourished that he's hallucinating. I don't know which. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Then they go back to Alan. And he thinks he's starving. Well, bud, you are. It's that simple. And he's talking about the tide not low at first light. Well, make yourself a torch and go out at night time when it is low. You see, this was a point I made earlier. The producers of this show, at the very first thing they put up is, these men are trained wilderness experts. Really? So far, I've not seen an expert on there at all. I've seen guys that have some training, but they're not experts. Not one of them. Oh. So, since the tide wasn't low enough, he uh, sets into eating seaweed again. And then he heads back to bed. And at this point, they move back to Lucas, and Lucas taps out. Now, I, am, I was quite shocked at that. I really thought it would end up being Lucas and Mitch in the end. And I really thought number 10 would be the end of it. So I got a little bit of a shock with that as well. Then Mitch finds a dead otter and he skins it. Why did he not eat the meat? This is a question I'm asking. Why did he not eat the meat? Was it too rotten to eat? If so, why bother with the hide? These are just questions. Uh, I don't have the answers. Then they move over to Sam again. He's talking about how helpless he feels. I really thought he was going to be the next to tap out at this point. Got a little surprise there, too. Then they go over to Alan. And he's checking his net, and he's got a, a couple of small dogfish. Well, well, shark is okay to eat if you've got nothing else to chaw on. He, he, he's mentioning as he's cooking it that it's got a funky taste to it. If he says so, I've never actually eaten dogfish. I know you can eat them. I've caught many of them. Matter of fact, the last time I caught a dogfish was on the Hellcat 2 out of New London, Connecticut when I went blue fishing. God, that was... Oh! 30 years ago? It's a long time. So far... As far as procuring food, I think Luke has done the best. And for second place, kind of a tie between Mitch and Allen. Though Mitch has gotten more protein, more meat, in the form of salmon, with his net than Allen has. Alan has been eating limpets, a lot of them, and snails, and well, that one giant banana slug he ate, mm, I've eaten them, they're not the best thing to be eating them, as far as palatability, and I certainly wouldn't eat one if I had any other choice, but then again, on Vancouver Island, at that time of year, there aren't a whole lot of choices.
The one thing I couldn't quite figure out was at, the next thing Alan's doing. He's eating his, his dogfish and seaweed and mussels stew. And by mussels, I refer to any of the uh, bivalves that he can pick along the edge of the shore. That would be blue mussels, clams, limpets, etc. I couldn't tell you exactly what he had, had in there. I think they were limpets, but I'm not positive of that. So he's eating his fish and, and, and bivalve stew in the rain. Why? Why doesn't he have a separate place set up where he can get out of the rain to eat that isn't right where he sleeps? I've made this point before. This is something true wilderness experts do. You have at least three separate camps. Over there you're going to have a butchering camp. That's where you're going to take your fresh kill and you're going to gut it and skin it and, and leave all the entrails there. And then you're going to take your fresh meat and you're going to move to camp number two over there. And that's going to be your cook camp. And this is the place where you're going to have a line run up over a limb 30, 40, 50 feet in the air. And on the end of that line you're going to have a bag that's primarily critter proof is in regards to squirrels, raccoons, that sort of thing. And in that bag you're going to hang your fresh meat inside that bag and hang it from that limb 40, 50 feet in the air where bears can't get at it. And you're going to have that, bear, that bag dangling 20 feet below the limb so when cougars try to jump for it from a limb above they're going to hit it, bounce off, and go flying. Thereby protecting your food from the critters. This is also where you're going to come to cook twice, three times a day, whatever you decide is necessary for you. Then you can take your meat that you cooked with you back to your sleep camp and eating it on the way, discarding bones and whatnot before you get to the halfway point between cook camp and sleep camp. You want nothing in sleep camp that's going to give the odor of meat and foods to draw the predators. The most you want to be making in sleep camp is like nettle tea or, or dandelion tea. Something you're going to use up and consume right there quick. And it doesn't smell like meat. That's what you want to be cooking in sleep camp. Not meat, not salmon, not deer, not none of it. Then they move over to Mitch and he's stretching out his otter hide. And he starts talking about his sickly mother and how she had extracted a promise from him to stick it out to the bitter end. Mitch, you know the lady's dying? You had two choices. Go for it and do the program or stay with mom. And mom told you to stick it out to the bitter end. Keep your promises to people who are dying. Keep your promises. In this world, all you really have is your word. Then he decides, uh, Alan, Alan decides to just lay around the shack for a while. And he starts talking about tapping out. Then we flip back over to Mitch. And he can't figure out why he's there. Day 43, three men left. And at this point I get the shock of my life. Mitch taps out. What's wrong with you, boy? You made a promise to Mama and you broke that promise. How disappointed is Mama going to be? Even if she has survived thus far. Alan, talking about Cranky and Sam, well, I'm going to think he's, he's just done gone around the bend. And I tell you, like I said, I'm shocked. I really thought this would end with episode 10. 
I guess the producers have decided to stretch it out another episode or two. We'll have to see. And that is alone, episode 10. Really, the only true disappointment I had in this episode, and I've already made this clear, is when you're dealing with a relative who's sickly, and they've asked you for a promise, you keep the promise. I don't care how hard it is. You keep promises to dying folk, folks. You want people to see you for character? See you for having character? If you've made a promise to somebody you know is not well and is likely to die, no matter how hard that is on you, you keep that promise. Peace out.